It began as any ordinary night. My shift started at six, and as usual, my first stop was the Newton stand. I sat there, admiring the sunset on this warm summer evening, expecting another boring Tuesday night. Newton won, the radio spoke, and I responded with a click of the little red button which identifies my taxi. The radio crackles to life, and again I'm giving an address for my first pickup. The first job is always a deterministic experience. I wonder what sights and people and events lay at the end of his path. I know that one job leads to another and gradually, as the hours slide by, I'll leave a twisted path over the city, looping back and forth, never knowing where I'll be in 30 minutes or who I'll meet, but knowing it depends on the job before, regardless of what Heisenberg says. By nine, I've covered over 120 kilometers and met a dozen or so people, each concerned with their own reality, all interesting in their own ways and all have a story to tell. There's a gorgeous depressed housewife come barmaid with a jealous husband who kissed me for understanding, a wife having an affair with a younger man who beats her while her husband stays home looking after the kids, the guy from Elizabeth who won $500 at the casino and gave me 100 because it made him feel important, the ABC radio commentator with a drinking problem, an ex-TV game show host who likes to eat toothpaste, then there are those strange offers in the middle of the night from men, women and transvestites, usually sexually related, and then there are the nutters. I've been sitting on the Tusmore stand for the last 40 minutes, bored out of my brain. Eventually, enough is enough, and I head to town to cruise Heimley Street, that street where the scum of the city seems to surface, where innocents are defiled by the one percenters. As I pull up in front of a popular disco to wait my next fare, I take in the surroundings and quietly watch the nightlife of the street. The girl sticks her head in through the window and kisses me and is gone as fast as she came. The street kid is just hanging out across the road waiting for something to happen and harassing people passing by. That's all they ever seem to do. Two guys leaning on the wall of the disco flirting with each other. I glance in the disco and notice a man emerge from the street and hope he doesn't want a taxi. The sort of person whose very image is built around violence. You see it in the way they walk making themselves look as large as possible in the typical threat posture of Neanderthals in gorillas. As he steps into the street, he turns left and notices the two gays. In a flash, he lunges at the nearest and starts bashing his head against the wall, again and again and again, in a level of violence I've seen only rarely. The other understandably bolts, while his friend's blood slides down the wall of the disco. A few seconds later, the violence is over, the Neanderthal walks away feeling pleased with himself. People passing by ignore the battered man bleeding on the footpath until one stops to help. The sight sickens me to my stomach. The radio sparks into life. Grandfall one, no reply. Grandfall vacant, and I react instantly to hit the little red button. At this time of night, the bank jobs go off at Grenfell Street, which are good jobs, and it's rare for the stand to be empty. The operator tells me to pick up a fare at the ANZ Bank in Piri, which sends me deep into the southern suburbs, a place I never like to linger. By 10.30, I'm working my way back towards the eastern suburbs and finally settle on the Mitcham stand in Weir Street. It's a good safe suburb to work and a good way to get back to town. I was just beginning to fall asleep when the door opened and someone got in next to me. I looked across at him through the darkness and quickly made an appraisal. He was a solidly built man with huge forearms and an afro hairstyle left over from the 70s. What stuck though was that he had a wild look about him, a look that unsettled me. Where to? I said. Take me to the central mission, Whitmore Square, he said angrily. As I turned in the only road, the hairs on the back of my neck began to prickle as they always do when something is wrong. Have a good night, I asked politely. Mm, no reply. After five minutes of silence, he spat out, I'm going to Russia. I thought about this statement before replying. Obviously, he's off the planet, and with these types you have to be very careful what you say. I said nothing and decided the best strategy was to ignore him. I'm going to Russia to talk to Gorbachev, he said forcefully. I refused to bite because I knew it was going to lead to an emotional outburst which in his mood would be vented at me. It's the only safe way to deal with someone like this, by not giving them the chance to direct their anger your way. You can usually escape problems. We were now only a few minutes from town. I'm going to Russia to talk to Gorbachev, he spat out again, almost daring me to ask the obvious question. I tried to keep my mouth shut, but I knew if I ignored him much longer he'd probably do his block. So innocently I asked in a calm voice, Are you? Why? I'm going to Russia to sort out Gorbachev about the Christians, he said with a feeling of self-importance and righteous vengeance. Alarm bells rang in my head as I realised this guy is nuts. A minute later I pulled up in Whitmore Square at the Central Mission. The fare was $7.40. 
He gave me $10 and told me to keep the change. This is usually a signal that all will be well, so I let out a sigh of relief. Suddenly, I was being strangled. I was stunned. Is this it? Is this how I'm going to die? I never thought I'd die a violent death in a taxi. I always felt immune to violence. Lights flashed through my eyes as his powerful hands tightened around my throat. I could feel my life being drained out of me. I tried to pry his huge arms apart, but my slight frame lacked the strength. I could hear myself gagging for air. Thoughts raced through my mind. Poor mum, she won't be able to deal with this. What would the family do? All those dreams gone. I saw myself being found dead, crumpled blue lump. Another violent taxi death of the six o'clock news. Then he said something I'll never quite forget. Something which absolutely stunned me. If you ever tell anyone I tipped you, I'll kill you. I swear it, I'll kill you. I was so shocked I couldn't think. Finally, I managed to gasp in submission. I, 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 I won't tell anyone. With that, he let go and got out. After that, I knocked off and I went home. And I drove the taxi again for a few more days that week, but never drove after that. That was a true story. <laughs>